something funny that happened. I'm just kind of learning things around here. Well, last Sunday, I uh, had a meeting at 3 o'clock here, and uh, I left after the church, and then I went to, to uh, eat, and then uh, was staying at the hotel last uh, Sunday. And so I went to the hotel, and I thought, well, I'll lay down for a minute before I go to the uh, meeting. And I turned on the television, and the television comes on, and guess what it was? <laughs> Someone forgot to tell me that this worship service is being broadcast on Sunday right after lunch, and I'm looking up, and here I am preaching. And uh, Now, there's a lot of sermons you can go to sleep in, but when you're the one doing the preaching, you don't dare do that, because <laughs> someone might find out that you went to sleep in your own sermon. So, Well, before I preach, I need to ask you to do something, and that is to reach down and catch hold of the pew that you're sitting on and hold on, because I'm fixing to ask you to tithe. A lot of people don't like to hear about tithing, and you know, this is the second Sunday I've been here, and I may be the shortest tenured pastor in the <laughs> history of this church and the second Sunday preaching on tithing, but I'm going to ask you to tithe. I know you've got a lot of assets and things that uh, you are very important to you, and uh, your investments and stocks and bonds or real estate or, or I see Rosalind Car uh, Rosalind. Uh, capital advertising on television, invest in gold and silver, and the only gold I have is in my teeth, so I don't think it's worth very much, but I don't know what about the other investments, but I know you have investments, and you're thinking, wait a minute, is he going to ask me to, invest, to, to take from my investments or take from my possessions and tithe? And no, I'm going to ask you something much more important than that. I'm going to ask you to tithe on your most precious possessions. What are your most precious possessions? You see, it's really not the things that you own that are of earthly significance because all those things, if you lost uh, the money in the stock market, uh, well, if you live a little longer, there's a good chance you're going to recover. The people in the 1920s recovered. The people in the 1980s recovered. And those of us who had investments in the 2000s, uh, we've recovered. And I got a, a note from my stockbroker the other day and report on 2017 and did pretty good. I wish every year was like 2017 on my investment. So if we had lost money, it's, uh, well, we don't like to lose money, but it, you can recover from those things. Those are, anything that you can recover from is really not your most valuable possession. What is your most valuable possession? It's those things that you can't replace. And there are two of them. Your time and your skills and your abilities, uh, those gifts that God has given to you. Now there's a story, it's printed in your scriptures here, and we're going to talk about it this morning, and it's a parable. And Jesus uh, used parables to teach, and you remember, a parable is an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. And so Jesus used these stories. He tells about a, a man who goes into a far country, and before he goes, he leaves his treasure with his servants. Now you remember as you read this that God is the one that Jesus was talking about who leaves his resources with his people. And he says the, the man went to a far country. I'm just going to paraphrase it for you. Uh, went to the far country and while he was gone uh, he gave to one five talents and that one took and invested them and he made five more. He gave to another two talents and he took those two and he invested and he made two more and he gave to one one and one talent uh, but he was afraid and he buried it in the ground. And when the, the king returned he called his servants in and wanted an account of what they had done with the things that he had entrusted to them while he was gone. And the first one came with five and said, you were gone and I made five more. Here's what belongs to you. And the king said, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and uh, rejoice with me in uh, what you have accomplished. And then the man who had two talents uh, he came and he said, I made two more, and here's what belongs to you. And the king said, well done, good and faithful servant, come and uh, rejoice with me. And the one who had one talent uh, came and he said, I knew you were a hard man. You gathered where you did not sow, and you reaped when you did not scatter seed. And I was afraid, and I buried your talent in the ground, and here it is, uh, I kept it for you safe. And the king said, you lazy, evil servant. And he ordered us to be taken from him. And he said, uh, you could have at least 
put it in the bank where it would have made interest, but instead you didn't do anything with it. And he ordered it be taken away from him. And he said, to those who have will much more be given. Literally meaning to those who have been faithful, those who have worked, those who have taken care of the resources that the king entrusted to him. That story is about God, and God has entrusted us with resources. And the two greatest possessions that you have are time. It's valuable because it can't be replaced. Yesterday is gone forever. You can't go back and recover yesterday. And your gifts and abilities, you can't transfer them to anybody else. They're yours. They're only to be used by you. Let's talk about that for a moment. I'm going to ask you to tithe on your time. I don't know whether anybody's ever talked to you about that, but stewardship is management. It's not just about giving. God is interested in your whole life, and He wants you to use all your life, and that begins with your greatest possession, your time. And I believe God intended for us to be faithful stewards and servants who manage our time wisely, and we use a portion of our time in honor of Him in serving Him. Time. Your time. When you get your 2018 stewardship packet in the mail in about two or three weeks, there's going to be a card in there, and it's going to ask you to tithe your time and say, how much time are you going to give to the church? You see, all of us have the same amount of time, 24 hours a day, 168 hours a week. And I did a little math, 8,760 hours for the year. Interesting thing, I don't know if any of you uh, would put uh, much confidence in this, but uh, Texas A&M University did a research project few years ago, and they said, how do we spend our time? And uh, they said, if the average person lives to be 80 years old, uh, how much of their time did they use in various things? Well, they said, we used 26 years of our 80 years sleeping. 26 years of your 80 years, you're going li- uh, to spend sleeping. Uh, you're going to spend 12 years of your 80 years working. Now, it seems like it's more than that, doesn't it? How many times have we said, oh, I haven't got time to do that, I've got to go to work? Only 12 years of your 80 years you spend working, nine years watching television, eight and a half years shopping. Now, guys, I don't know whether they average the the girls and the guys, I'm not going to go there. Five years eating. You spend five years of your life eating. Well, some of us may spend a little bit more than that. I better not go there either. Four years talking on the phone. Three years washing clothes. And the last 13 years, they listed a number of other things. Well, I read that, and I thought, that's interesting. I think I'm going to do a little calculation. So I said, if from the day you were born until the day you die, if every Sunday... You were in church for worship, one hour. We're going to be there a little longer today. I'll make up for some time, maybe you didn't make it. If you were there for one hour, how much of your life did you spend in worship? And it amounted to 173 days, less than half a year. Now, I thought, that can't be right because I've heard sermons that lasted longer than that. (laughs) Well, if you add to that Sunday school and... uh, other activities that you volunteer and serve in and you add everything together, you might be able to get that up to about two years maybe. Uh, But how do we spend our time? Many of us recognize that time is one of those things that gets away from us very easily. And we look back and say, well, I don't know where the time went. I I don't know what happened, but uh, I just don't seem like I have as much time anymore as I used to. You know what that's like? Uh, Time. Gets away. Time slips away, and if we don't manage our time, we wind up with much of our time being wasted instead of used productively. We have a wonderful young couple that live behind us that just moved in a year or so ago at, at our <clears throat> in our home in Amarillo. We have rear rear entry garages, and their garage is right straight across from ours. and And I was out in the driveway the other day, and she came out, ripped at the garage door and walked out, and I mean, she was dressed like she was going to the most magnificent party you can't imagine. I looked across the alley, I saw her, I said, what in the world is going on? You're all dressed up like you're fixing to go. Uh, is it a birthday, uh, an anniversary? What's the special occasion? And she said, no, it's date night. 
And I thought, wait a minute, I thought she was buried. <laughs> date night? I said, what do you mean date night? And she said, well, my husband and I have a date uh, once a month. I said, that's interesting. Tell me about it. And she said, uh, we, uh, we've made a commitment to each other. That once a month, they've got three small children, about two years old and six years old and ten years old. And we made a commitment that, that twice a month we were going to take them to do something special that they love to do. And then once a month we were going to have a date night. And she said, we've been doing that for the last uh, four or five years. And she said, it's, it's been wonderful. Their oldest son uh, loves Kevin Durant. I, I assume everybody here knows who Kevin Durant is. Plays for the Oklahoma, Th or used to play for the Oklahoma Thunder, now with the Golden State Warriors. And he loves Kevin Durant. My wife loves Kevin Durant. I, uh, she tells me what he's done, how many points he's scored. And anyway, uh, they were playing, uh, Warriors were playing Thunder <clears throat> not too long ago. And that was their special event they were going to do with the kids. And they'd been playing it for several months and going to take the kids to see Kevin Durant play basketball. Well, after they got back, that's all I heard from uh, their, their son Cade for about three weeks. I mean, Kevin did this. Kevin did that. Kevin scored 40 points. Kevin, I mean, anyway, they do something special with their kids. And I said, well, what is this date night? Y'all are married. Yeah, but she said, let me tell you where it started. She said she's an interior decorator, and he works in IT, information technology, for a large company in Amarillo. And they're busy in their careers and going. And she said when our second baby was born, she said we were so busy. We were just running all the time and taking care of kids and then trying to do our jobs and everything. And she said we didn't realize that what we were sacrificing was our time together as a family and as a husband and wife. And she said, we, we started having some problems and said, we weren't communicating, we weren't talking, and, and the problems made it worse. And she said, we, we'd have a quick meal together and then we were off and running in different directions. And she said, in fact, it got so bad that one day we were sitting at the table and my husband said, I think we ought to separate. We didn't know what to do, she said. She said, about that time, one of their close friends invited them to go to church. And he, her uh, husband had grown up in a church. Uh, she had not grown up in a church. And, and they didn't know what else to do. And they said, okay, let's, let's go with them to church. And they went to church. They enjoyed it. And they went back uh, uh, two or three times uh, to church. And the, the church was having a marriage enrichment seminar. And these friends said, come go with us to the marriage enrichment seminar. Well, they really didn't want to do that because they were having so many problems in their relationship. But they said, okay. And they went. And she said, it's the greatest thing that ever happened to us. She said the first thing they said is, if you don't take time, it'll destroy your life. Take time for God. Make a commitment of your life to take time for God, and it'll make a difference in everything else you do. And second of all, take time for one another in your marriage, your husband, your wife. And she said, we went home at night. We sat down, and we looked at each other. And my husband said, I think I know what our problem is. We haven't been taking time for the Lord. And we need to make a commitment to do that. And she said she had never made a commitment like that before, but she agreed and she made a commitment to, to the Lord. And they set that as number one priority in their life. And then they made a commitment to each other. And she said, we've been having a date ever since, once a month. And she said, we're more in love today than we've ever been in our lives. Where did it start? Managing their time. I believe God wants you and me to manage our time, the time that He's given us, however long it is, to manage it wisely and to use it wisely. And I believe part of that time needs to be dedicated to the Lord. And we need to take uh, and fill out, uh, now, 168 hours. If you gave 10% of your time, that'd be 16 hours a week. Now, number one, I believe God wants you to rest. So you can spend part of that time resting and honoring Him. And you can spend part of that time eating and honoring Him, but there's some of that time that you need to be doing things for the church and for the ministry of the kingdom. I'm going to ask you to tithe your time this year. To set a goal. Goals are not just important for our financial well-being. Goals are important for our life well-being. And the most precious possession you have is your time. And when you budget your time, and you manage your time, and you set your priorities and keep first things first, it makes a huge difference. Let me tell you the second thing. 
The second thing is managing your abilities, your skills. Whatever it is you do, whatever gifts God has given you, whatever inclinations and natural desires you have, and you're using those today in making a living or doing your career, but using those things wisely and in a way that honors the Lord. A lot of people I know have never thought about tithing their abilities. I don't know about you, but they've never thought about my using what gifts I have, my abilities, my skills, not just to make a living, but also to do something for God's kingdom. I have a good friend in North Carolina. He's been extremely successful. He has uh, put together a, a, a huge uh, estate. He owns 12 John Deere dealerships scattered out across Virginia and North Carolina. He has a large trucking company. He sits on the board of one of the Fortune 500 companies in America. And he, uh, four years ago, decided that the real place that needed to invest money was in real estate. And he put together a group of friends, and they started buying farmland. They own $600 million worth of farmland today. I can't even imagine that. He was telling me about that a, a couple of years ago and just telling me, you know, how it was working, how it was going, and, and why he felt like that was really a great investment and for the future. And when he finished telling me, I said, can I, can I ask you a question? And he said, well, yeah. And I, I could tell he thought I was going to ask you a question about that investment and how he was doing with that. And I said, I want to ask you a question. What are you doing? You've got God has given you great ability. You not only have the ability to dream great dreams, you have the ability to put them into reality. But I want to know, how are you using that ability in such a way that it has eternal significance and not just earthly value? Well, he looked kind of stunned. And he's the kind of man that doesn't just pop off and give you a quick, easy answer. He's pretty reflective, and he thought about it. And finally, he said, well, I have to admit that almost all the things I'm doing have earthly significance. I'm not sure they have much eternal significance. And I said, you remember Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where rust and moth cannot corrupt and thieves cannot break in and steal. And you need to be laying up for yourself treasures in heaven that have eternal significance. And he said, well, what do you have in mind? And I said, I don't have anything in mind. You're going to have to ask the Lord. You see, Romans 8, 14 says, All who are the children of God are led by the Spirit of God. He's a deeply committed Christian, faithful member of his church, active in so many Christian ministries. And I said, God is going to lead you because you belong to him, and he's going to help you know where you can use your talent, your skill, your ability to make a difference that has eternal benefit. He said, well, I guess I'd never really thought about that before. When you get your 2018 stewardship packet, it's going to say, where are you going to put your ability this year to work for the church and the ministries of the church? I'm going to ask our staff. They do a, such a wonderful job here and great staff you've got. But I'm going to ask Chris to give me a list of all the places she needs help with children's ministry. Ask Morgan all the places she needs help with youth ministry. Ask Nick all the places he, ne he needs volunteers and help uh, with choir and other music ministries. And, and ask every one of them. We're going to make a complete list. And in your stewardship packet, you're going to have a long list of places where you can be involved with Project Noel or whether it's feeding people in Thanksgiving or helping the vacation Bible school or where it is. There's going to be a long list of places that you can be involved and use your talent, your gift, your uh, in service that has eternal significance. It may be ushering. It may be singing in the choir. It may be greeting. It may be teaching in vacation Bible school. But I'm going to ask you to do that. I'm going to ask you to use your ability, whatever abilities you have, and all of us have abilities that God has given to us, and hopefully you've taken whatever ability God gave you, whatever desire He put in your heart, and you've increased that and built it up over time, and you're better at it today than you used to be. But if you're a salesman, I'm going to say, in addition to selling your whatever it is you sell, I want you to make a commitment that you're not just going to use 100% of your ability to sell, selling uh, for uh, earthly purposes, but I want you to do 90% of that and say 10% of this ability to sell things I'm going to use for the church, for the kingdom. 
If you're in medical care, I'm going to ask you to use 90% in taking care of the medical care that you're involved in and 10% helping the church. Uh, if you're a teacher, teaching whatever you teach 90% of the time, but using 10% of that gift in a way that has eternal significance. Do you understand what I'm talking about? All of us have gifts that God has given to us and abilities to do things. And God wants a return. That's what the parable said. Jesus said, someday the king is coming back and he's going to ask, how did you do? And I don't know about you, but I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And the only reason he says, well done, good and faithful servant, is because you and I managed what he gave us in a way that honored him and served his purpose in the world. You're going to be asked to do that. I want to ask you to tithe because I believe in tithing. I believe in budgeting my time. I believe in, in uh, using my abilities. I believe those are things that God has entrusted to me, and I want to use them in a way that honors him and shows the priority of my life. I want you to do that too. But let me close with this. We've got a wonderful church here. A lot of wonderful people. But there's something I've already learned about this church. And that is that less than half of the members of our church are engaged, involved in some service through our church. A lot of people attend worship, Sunday school. But I'm talking about giving your ability and your time for the ministry of the church. Less than half. How can we expect our church to be strong and healthy if only half of the members, or less than half of the members, are doing something that help us in ministry? Now, all of you came to church this morning in a car. What, it was, what would it be like if that car, only half the parts on that car were working? You went out and only had two tires aired up and two of them were flat. You only had two windows that were up and the rest of them were down. You only had, you know what I'm talking about. You'd look at that and say, that's a pile of junk. I couldn't ride this church in that. It wouldn't get you anywhere. But we expect the church to be able to operate with less than half of the parts of our church serving and working. Let me ask you another question. What if half the parts in your body were not working today? You wouldn't be here in church. You'd be in the intensive care unit at the hospital or the nursing home. You wouldn't be healthy. You wouldn't be enjoying what you're doing because we can't live if only half the parts of our body are working. But we expect our church to get by with that. I want to challenge you to tithe. Tithe your time. Tithe your ability. Use your life in a way that has eternal significance. Let's pray together. Father, Help us to hear your word. And help us, Lord, to not just hear it, but as the scripture says, be doers of the word as well. And to be ready to make a commitment this year that we are going to be stewards of what you have given to us. We're going to manage all of our life in ways that honor you, but we're going to take a part of what we have, our time, our abilities, and use it for ministry in this church and for your kingdom. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.